Okay, let me just give uh, people a minute to just get in um, and then explain some new rules of the game <laughs> and we can move on. All right, let me just start with some um, new rules of the game. So welcome everyone to the Growing Up in Academia in 2023. You know, it's incredible, you know, how fast, you know, like time fly. Um, we've been doing this for over five years and slowly but steadily, I've, I've come to realize that there is some things that need to change, even though I've, you know, it's with my, you know, some somewhat of a difficult, you know, or or complicated, you know, internal tribulations, which is, um, people have asked me for a long while to record these sessions because they want to, you know, like then see like the or take part in the discussions that we have had in the past. And I have always said no, there is no way that we're going to record these discussions. The whole point is is making them, you know, live and you know, it's spontaneous. You know, we can say something. We feel in a protected space. Um, but you know, over the over time, I've come to realize that perhaps there is a way in which we can balance these two things. So uh, in discussions with Lisa, in, you know, in sharing with her my tribulations as to you know what, what would be the best way to go, uh, we decided we're going to record the session. This doesn't mean that we're going to make it available as it was. Uh, the idea is to then, you know, make it shorter, um, perhaps more condensed, um, and, you know, then share it, you know, with the public later on. So here we are in a new in a new phase. <laughs> Let's see how it goes. Um, and uh, yeah, so you know, for those of you that you know know this, the session is being recorded, um, and we hope that you know this will serve more people than the the, the audience that we have so far. Um, and it's my great pleasure to have today Lisa Mirachi. Um, she is a philosopher. She received her BA in philosophy from Harvard in two thousand and nine and then her PhD in philosophy as well and certificate in cognitive science from Rutgers University uh, in 2014. She was then an assistant professor and a faculty fellow at, uh, of philosophy at NYU. She was associated with the NYU Center for, Brain, uh, for Mind, Brains and Consciousness. Then she joined the Department uh, of Philosophy in the University of Pennsylvania, where she was an associate professor of philosophy with tenure. There she was also affiliated faculty in MindCore and GRASP. General Robotics Automa Automation Sensation and Perception Lab, and Carlos is an assistant professor of philosophy at the University of Denver, as well as an IEE Tech Ethics Ambassador and a member of the IEE SA Working Group of the Ethics of Laws. Um, she works on issues regarding the nature and explanations of the mind and intelligence, as well as ethical implications of AI and robotics technology. She's published in high uh, profile philosophy journals, such as the Journal of Philosophy and Philosophical Studies, and has interdisciplinary publications in venues such as Frontiers in Neuro Robotics. In 2022, she was awarded an NEH grant from her book project, tentatively entitled Meaning and Intelligence, towards the next wave effective and ethical intelligence research, which develops a systematic approach to intelligence and its explanation and facilitates the integration of ethical feminist and social justice concerns into AI development and research. Lisa is also passionate about making academia more diverse and inclusive. And at Penn, she has served as the philosophy department wellness advisor, as well as a faculty wellness advisor to graduate students in SAS. And she's a member of the LGBT uh, faculty working group, uh, or she was a member of the LGBT uh, faculty working group at, uh, Penn, at, at UPenn. And um, I invited Lisa because I hope that, you know, through the stellar CV that she has, you may have noticed some interesting, you know, parts already going from being a, an associate professor with tenure 
um, in Penn to be in non-tenure yet, but hopefully soon uh, at Denver. So Lisa, I am thrilled to hear your story and you know to share with others you know what what your path has been. But thanks for coming. Oh my goodness! Thank you so much for having me. I'm really delighted to be here. And um, I really do want to make this a uh, conversation. Um, so please um, put questions in the chat and uh, I'll try to be as, as open and helpful as I can in answering them. Um, I want to keep my little part short. I know a lot will come out as we, as we go. Um, but uh, um, I think I'll start by working backwards. So as, uh, as Lucia mentioned, um, I had tenure at the University of Pennsylvania, um, which in many ways um, was uh, ideal for, uh, for my research, um, uh, especially the way I've been moving the last several years into artificial intelligence and robotics, um, where I have, I still have uh, strong interdisciplinary connections with robotics and with cognitive science there. Um, but in uh, to 2019, I met the love of my life, and uh, she uh, has two children uh, who she has half the time uh, in Denver, Colorado. And so I knew that um, if I was going to be personally happy, I would have to make that happen in Denver. And, uh, and so um, there were lots of... Uh, I looked for all the, all the jobs <laughs> in the Denver area. Um, and uh, what ended up panning out was that I won a junior search. So they were searching already in the philosophy department, um, which I have mixed feelings about because I already had tenure at a prestigious institution. And so in some ways it's not fair <laughs> for me to be competing against uh, graduate students who are, are finishing. Um, but I think uh, I think in some ways it speaks to the way in which our pipelines are broken. Um, that someone like me, their best uh, job option is to win a junior search. Um, but that's that's what happened, and so they uh, they couldn't offer me because they offered it as a junior position. They couldn't offer um, the position to me tenured. So I am up for tenure again this year, and. Um, and it's all going well so far. Hopefully this summer I'll have confirmation. Um, but it was a scary thing to, um, to give up the security of tenure, which is often held up as the thing that we're going for and fight and uh, working so hard for. Um, uh, but I knew it was the only way that, that I could be happy. Um, when I got tenure at Penn, which happened in... Um, uh, uh, May 2020 or the summer of 2021, um, I was actually kind of angry <laughs> and I was surprised at that emotion because tenure had been held up as this thing, this sort of security where if you just, at least I felt like if I just worked really hard and, um, sort of prioritized uh, prioritize that above everything else, then I would have the security from which I could make more balanced decisions. Um, and that wasn't the way it worked out for me at all. Um, uh, I had to just make those decisions anyways. Um, and so one thing that I definitely think about differently um, after my experiences over the last few years is that I now really encourage my students and mentees um, all the way through to make the decisions that are personally best for them. And, um, and not to wait until some point when they'll be secure enough to make those decisions. Um, so that's been, um, that's the short story of my journey over the last, uh, last couple of years. Um, before that, um, one of the things that I wanted to draw out um, from the unofficial CV that that I posted online um, for us to maybe talk about further is um, I originally started out, um, uh, I've, I've battled anxiety um, my whole life and, uh, and it's been a challenge. Um, and originally I dealt with it by sort of just pushing harder <laughs> and knuckling down. And, uh, and that really stopped working for me. 
um, especially midway through graduate school, I was very burnt out. And, um, and so I've been looking for um, gentler ways of uh, coping and of um, managing some of the anxiety and imposter syndrome and other challenges um, that have come up for me. Um, and I'm really passionate about sharing that and sharing that perspective with um, with other people in academia, because I think often there's this um, there's this idea that in order to be a rigorous academic, you have to be hard and just keep pushing through things. And I've come to think that it's the opposite. I think we do our best and most creative work when we feel safe and supported and when we're taking care of ourselves as whole people. And, um, and I try to live that way myself. And that's the way that I try to teach and mentor. Um, and, uh, um, so yeah, um, that's something that's very important to me and, um, and I'm happy to talk about that or anything else as we go on. So with that, I think I'll, I'll stop and we can have more of a discussion. Cool. Thank you, Lisa. So there's a lot of things that, you know, your 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 CV is very particular about. So let, let's let's work with the backward parts. You know, like so the the tenure, like what what that meant in terms of like personal choices uh, and so on. What was your you know what were your thoughts when you were confronted with the decision, so to speak, of giving up the things that you have been working the hardest for, and then recognizing that there was there didn't seem to be like an easy way to just make them both happen, right? Or, or perhaps actually, let me ask you a question the way around. Like, why could they not happen at the same time? So why could you not stay at Penn? Why Penn did not offer you something different or why Denver? Like, so what, 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 what happened then that did not make it uh, possible to? Yeah, um, I think there are lots of structural issues in academia and I think they tend to affect um, I think they tend to affect women uh, for a variety of reasons more than they affect other people. Um, but I myself was surprised at um, how little I felt held by academia generally, um, in the sense that um, I've, I've given my life to, uh, to um, both to research and teaching, but also to making academia a better place. And then when I needed support and flexibility, um, it really felt honestly like it wasn't there um, from, from any angle. And, and not that there wasn't uh, some interest in hiring me or and so on, but um, there were many twists and turns where, um, where either I came up against roadblocks or I felt that... Um, uh, people weren't personally invested in me enough, or it was too costly to try to make something work. So, you know, I've heard of other philosophy faculty who were in a similar position to me having arrangements where they stacked all their courses into one semester, or um, uh, or they moved some of their teaching online, or things like that, and. Um, uh, and I wasn't offered flexible choices um, uh, at Penn. So there wasn't- How, how so? It, it, it's because the system is not geared to offer something of that sort or what, 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 what could have been different? Yeah, I mean, I think, um, I don't, you know, in some ways I don't know enough about the pers the sort of exactly what happened on the other side of it. But I do think that there's a kind of often inflexibility, especially at more prestigious institutions because they can always hire the next person. And so they're going to get someone fabulous to replace me and that's great <laughs> for them. But I think it disincentivizes institutions like that from really fighting to, um, to protect and support the faculty that they already have. Mm -hmm. um, uh, so I think part of it is that they don't have enough incentives to really do that. And so then the personal, the personal aspect of it gets lost. It, it gets lost that there was this, this human <laughs> who, uh, 
who had a lot of personal investments in, in an institution and, um, um, and has sort of personal needs at that point. Um, I also think that in, in the, uh, under the auspices of fairness or under, you know, people are motivated by fairness, they might have pretty strict protocols or guidelines um, that maybe in many cases do um, do advance equity. Um, but uh, in other cases, what's needed is more flexibility because often, um, like my situation was in many ways particular. So I wasn't movable. Um, uh, um, and so, and so what I needed was more flexibility, um, from, from all the institutions. Um, and that was something that I felt like wasn't particularly offered. Um, and so I think one thing that if people are really serious about retention of faculty or recruitment of mid-level faculty um, in ways that make them feel really supported. I think having some flexibility and attention to their personal needs and situation uh, would go a long way. Um, so, so you mentioned, you know, so I guess there is, there is two sides of this problem, right? So on the one hand is, could you, the university where you were before have offered a better package for retention. And, you know, there is many structural reasons for that. You mentioned, you know, like, so equity, fairness, perhaps, you know, other people would have felt, why do I have to, you know, like put up with being here the whole year and you don't? So I, I can understand that part. Um, now, what happened on the other side of, you know, recruitment, right? So why, why it's, 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 it's kind of like, no, I, I can't quite understand why you go from, you know, where you are recruited to a place already with tenure and then you don't, you know, your tenure is not honored. Like, wh 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 how, does that, how does that happen? Yeah, um, you know, in many ways, I don't know exactly what happened, um, but, uh, but it, in many ways, um, I can speak to how it made me feel, <laughs> which is that it made me feel undervalued. Um, it, it made me feel like my expertise and my accomplishments weren't, um, were not valued enough by this institution. Um, and I think one thing that I've, um, perhaps because I had been so successful before in life, um, in, um, uh, in my academic professional life, um, in some ways, I think academia can have a kind of star, star culture where mm -hmm. there are some people who do get special treatment, at least at certain points. Um, but it's never, <laughs> um, one can never take that for granted. And I think a lot of people um, don't experience academia that way and experience it as a very um, rigid structure um, that is very competitive with very hard rules. And a lot of it doesn't necessarily make sense. And um, uh, so what I was told was that the PR department, oh, sorry, the HR department at the University of Denver had a very strict policy of not hiring um, faculty at a different level than the job position was advertised at. Um, and so that was the only option that was made available to me. Um, still, I had to work pretty hard to ensure that I would go up for tenure this year. So that was something that, um, that I had to negotiate, not with my department, but with the school itself. And quite frankly, I don't know why I had to work so hard. Um, to achieve that. Um, I had the support from the department, but um, it felt a little bit like I was being asked to prove myself over and over again in a way that was incommensurate with um, what I had already done in my career. 
I mean, I, I think that what is, you know, you, you mentioned the, the part of being undervalued, which I think, you know, the, you can also think about coming to an institution, you know, like, okay, you go, you know, because of family reasons, so that's going to make you happy and productive, hopefully. But at the same time, if this is at the cost of feeling undervalued and undermined, you know, it's also not going to necessarily lead to the best investment into that university. So I also, I, I, I feel myself a little bit, you know, like under, like, I don't understand how a system would not want to make you to feel happy and at the same time, you know, give your best self such that then you can teach the students. And so it's, it's also like, it's strange to think about from the, from, the, from the point of view of the university, right? So if you're trying to hire a CEO and then you try to pay him, you know, her, you know, a different salary, like, of course, you know, it's reasonable to think that that person may not work as hard as it should, right? Um, so it's still it's, it's a strange, yeah, <laughs> it's a strange constellation. Yeah. Yeah. To say the least. I mean, I completely agree, and I also think it's there's a similar issue kind of all over the place as the one that I mentioned at Penn, which is that the market, especially in in um, uh, in the humanities, but I also feel like throughout uh, the university, the market is flooded with great talent. And that is, you know, in many ways, a wonderful thing. We are producing really great people um, who are doing great work. Um, but I don't think that the, the priorities of universities are then geared around um, those personal relationships that would, um, that would really help people thrive in academic settings. Um, if you if you if you don't fit into the system that already exists, then so much the worse for you. They'll find someone else who does. Um, and I think that is really um, one of the things that is dehumanizing about academia. Now, if you if you were to think about um, a different future, right? You know, like so, if you know, given what you have learned through your own experience, plus what you have seen in other colleagues and in other students, what are the, what, what do you think we should be thinking about making academia more interesting, right? So you work on AI, right? You know, um, I can imagine that in the future, it will be far more interesting to go work for Google, even though they are laying off people you know, like crazy, but, but still, the, the, still the, the, the salaries are significantly higher. You get to work, you know, like, at least you get your salary pays for the amount of hours that you put in. In academia, you know, there's many jobs that we're not even paid for. So, you know, I, I you know, particularly, I mean, I'm, I'm, you know, I think there will be a lot of just massive, you know, exodus into, you know, industry, right? So how could we make academia a place that, again, drives innovation, drives good people, um, and also make them, you know, like, you know, it's an it, it has incentives for us to stay. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And I do think that, um, you know, people have talked in COVID in this culture, uh, in, in the context of COVID, that there's an increased culture of quitting, um, which in some ways I think is great. I think putting pressure on uh, universities to um, to really think through this problem is is great. I think for a long time, especially in philosophy, where although there are many alternate career paths, especially for somebody like me who does um, philosophy of artificial intelligence, um, in many ways those career paths haven't been super evident or haven't been super obvious. Um, but now they're becoming more obvious and more attractive, and so if you're not going to do it for the money, <laughs> right, which we're not, <laughs> um, I think making it work for you as a person is, is going to become increasingly important. So I think um, for me, one thing that, that really shifted is um, the, the sort of respect and prestige I had as a tenured Ivy League professor um, started to feel not real to me when, when push came to shove and I needed something from my institution and my discipline and then it wasn't there, right? And so I think there's a mismatch between 
how we talk about people and how we may elevate them in discussions or conversations, but when they actually need support, um, is, is that institution going to come in in the same kind of way and make sure that they get what they need? And so I would love to see an, an academia going forward that really uh, prioritizes the human element in uh, in all of this, and not just not just the official CV, <laughs> right? But all of the other things that go into making making it possible for people to work. Um, and this issue affects women and people of color and people from other under underrepresented groups way more often than it does um, than it does uh, uh, people who are from more privileged groups. So it's you know. Although I'm in a homosexual relationship, my wife is 10 years older than me. She already had children. I was waiting to have uh, my own children until I got tenure. Um, and we have a little one on the way, which is really exciting. Um, uh, but that meant, for example, that if I was going to try to commute back to Penn um, to teach, I, there's no way I could do that well we expanded our family. It's just physically impossible. And so the choice, one of the choices I had to make was between um, not having the family life that I had always dreamed of and always wanted and in many ways put off until after post tenure, uh, because that's what people had advised me was the smart thing to do. Um, but I still couldn't have that family and have the kind of career I wanted at the same time. Um, and maybe, you know, who knows, I'm at the beginning of rebuilding and I don't know exactly how it's going to go. Um, but in order to have that family life, it still required big career sacrifices. Um, so there was no point at which, oh, you've made it and now the institution will take care of you and support you in these other aspects of your life. That just wasn't a reality for me. Let me, you know, because of you were talking about the things that you decided not to do and so on, they, they bring bring one excellent question from Sonia Roberts from, from the from the audience. She asked, um, what are some things you decided not to do until tenure that you are now advising other people to do pre-tenure? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, hi, Sonia. <laughs> um, one is definitely have children. Um, so I had been advised explicitly often um, that if I could wait to have tenure to have children, I should. And that was part of um, part of my intensity at moving through everything so quickly. So I got my PhD in five years. Um, uh, I did do a one year um, a one year uh, postdoc position at NYU, um, which was wonderful. Um, but it was only one year. And then I went, you know, I was lucky enough to be able to go straight to the tenure track and um, and really push through to make sure that that all happened um, in time. And I'm now 35, and so uh, so it's time. <laughs> I'm you know I'm old <laughs> by uh, by medical standards uh, for having um, having my own uh, carrying my own children, um, and many people don't even have that luxury. So with especially the increase in the number of postdocs that you're expected to do and things like that. Um, and the time it often takes to complete your dissertation. Um, many people don't have that option anymore. Um, and in my experience, it didn't, it didn't make that decision feel safer <laughs> to me. Um, I still had to take a lot of risks to do it. And so I would really recommend that, um, uh, that if you want to have children, you should do it on the timeline that works for you and your family um, and not wait until you're supposedly secure in your uh, professional life. It, if I may, what was the, so from, from when you were receiving that advice, what was the reasoning behind like having to wait? What would happen after tenure that would enable you to have kids that was not possible before? Like what, what is the impediment? I think, I think it was the perception of security that tenure would provide. So it would allow it would allow you to slow down a little bit, um, and perhaps to have things not go exactly as planned, um, and still not have not lose your job, <laughs> um, because um, because you had um, because you had tenure. 
Um, uh, I think that's the main thing. The other thing is, um, I, and, and this, you know, this wasn't necessarily in the context of someone advising me to wait, but many stories that I had heard of other women who, um, who had chosen to have children. The one thing about academia is you can't put everything on hold. The world just moves on without you. And, um, and so I, you know, I've heard stories from friends where they um, presented some ideas at a talk and then had their baby and then tried to publish that paper two years later. And um, someone else had already published a paper responding to that idea. So they couldn't get their paper published. Um, and so when we think about <laughs> how, how academia moves on without you, you can stop a tenure clock Maybe, <laughs> you know, in many in many institutions now, you can stop a tenure clock, and um, um, there there might be challenges to to that too. Um, but that's not all we do. A lot of what we do is beyond our institutional walls, and that never stops. Um, and I think there's much less um, in my my perception <laughs> is that there's less sort of general support in terms of making sure that um, for this extramural stuff that we all do, that's a big important part of our job, making sure that people are supported um, through their childbearing years. And so I think part of the push is to make sure you get that level of prestige where you're in. So that way, if you miss the beat for a little while, you're not totally out of the loop. Um, I think that's a big part of it. Um, just to go back quickly to Sonia's question, I think more generally, if there are personal things you want to do with your life, now I, I encourage students and mentees to do those things um, when the time feels right to them and not to wait. So ch having children is just one example, um, but, uh, but really any important life decision. I also... Um, uh, if, pe if being in a certain geographical location is really important, um, I try to be as supportive of that as possible. Um, I think there are lots of pressures in academia to move wherever it is that you get a job. And that is hugely disruptive to people and their families, um, especially, um, especially people with dual career families, um, uh, whether or not that other partner is in academia. So I really encourage people to make make the decisions that are personally right for them. Um, yeah. Tell me now, so we started with when you are now, right? The, the challenges that are more current, but I wanna now bring you to the very start of your career. And I, and I asked you before, like, you know, I, you know, I don't belong to a family of academics and philosophy was certainly one of those things that was never under my radar. I, I, you know, like I, you know, I didn't even know that, I knew that people were thinking, and I knew that were philosophers in high school, but I couldn't even picture like what that what do a philosopher do, you know, like. Um, and then I came to the study of consciousness and I realized that, you know, philosophers were, you know, they they have their manners of discussing um, that sometimes felt a little bit harsh for me. And I and in seeing those interactions, like I know that they, you know, like you, you guys get trained and you know you're very good at you know like making arguments on the fly and you're super smart. But I also felt that some of those discussions were pretty aggressive. Mm -hmm. So I think if I even have to choose now, I'm not sure when I would choose to be a philosopher, even though I think it's a great it's a, now that I understand what philosophers do, I think that it's a great thing to do, you know, to think and get paid, you know, like to to think about that. But in seeing the community, it seemed to me like a pretty harsh community. So, am I, did, did I get the did I get that wrong? Like, am I wrong in my in my perception of what philosophy is, and that it's not that easy to navigate? Yeah. Um, so I think um, I do think that in some ways the field is shifting. Up shifting a little bit in the right direction, maybe not as quickly as I would want or other people would want. Um, but I think your perception of it is definitely a lot of people's experience. Um, and when I was an undergrad and in the first part of grad school, I really felt like 
I had to, I had to step it up and play an aggressive game because that was how people did philosophy. And I feel very lucky to have, um, to have had some mentors along the way who showed me a different model. So one person I really credit with this is Ernie Souza, who is one of my dissertation advisors, who ran a dissertation group that I modeled my, um, my research group at Penn after, um, where he was um, unwaveringly about the ideas and about the philosophy and the argument, but he was really kind. And he came at it from the angle of wanting each of us to have the best version of our projects that we could possibly have, not trying to one up <laughs> one up uh, us or have have us one up each other, but to have us really help each other um, develop our projects and have the best versions of our projects that we could have. And that made a huge impression on me. And I started to see, oh, <laughs> there's a different way. There's a different way we can do this. Um, and so I feel very lucky to have had some great examples of people who, who did it differently. Um, and the more I started to do it differently, um, the better I felt in my body. <laughs> it doesn't feel good <laughs> to engage with other people in that kind of one-upsmanship kind of way. Um, that said, I think there are lots of challenges in that kind of environment that, that take their toll. Um, one thing that I did in graduate school is I felt, I felt like I wasn't taken seriously often in that setting because people also come with the, um, expectations of who the clever ones are going to be. And, um, you know, it might not be a surprise that the clever ones don't really look like me, or at least that's the perception. And so um, I would often feel in Q&A that I wasn't being taken seriously. And so one thing I started practicing was um, to have my first question be a counterexample, which is sort of philosophical currency of cleverness. Um, and, uh, and if I could do that successfully, which I learned how to do, I think it's really a skill, uh, much more than kind of innate brilliance. Um, but I learned how to do that. And then I felt like people took me much more seriously because I had sort of proven myself along that, you know, dimension that, uh, that philosophers prize so highly. And then I could have more open-ended to, and to me more interesting conversations about the ideas, but I did feel like I had to prove myself uh, in a way that um, is probably counterproductive uh, for the culture. Um, and I think um, uh, um, you know, I, I was just sort of looking at the chat and maybe, maybe we'll get to, to that other question too, but you know, I think it affects a lot of us differently, but I think it definitely um, affected me in terms of having anxiety about engaging in these kinds of discussions and uh the yeah, more that, is that towards... imposter syndrome is that the feeling like you know you don't belong or you know they're faking it like what what what, what was the anxiety triggering yeah i think i think it's complicated sometimes it's a worrying that uh you don't belong or you're not good enough um and sometimes it's feeling like you are good enough, but you still won't be taken seriously. And that's also a very precarious position to be in because it feels like in some ways it doesn't matter how good you are. <laughs> um, your position is still precarious. Um, and that's very anxiety inducing too. Um, do, do you, I mean, philosophy is one of those fields where the you know, percentage of women is very small. So the, you know, it's like 10%, I don't know, like it's really, it's, it's perhaps actually it's like in mathematics, you know, <laughs> like really, really small. Um, so do you think that part of your feeling of insecurity or, you know, feeling not good enough has something to do with that you didn't have, you know, other peers that were similar to you in the, in the same, you know, caring perhaps or less aggressive, you know, attitude? Um, or, or you think that, you know, if it had been, you know, same, you know, 50-50 or even, you know, the opposite, uh, you would have still felt that way. I mean, I definitely feel like um, more representation of women would have 
helped. I think more representation of various groups <laughs> would have helped more diversity um, because I think um, that would help to make a culture that's more um, where, where there are sort of multiple ways of engaging and those are all taken to be um, legitimate legitimate ways of engaging. Um, one story that I, I often tell uh, my students to give them a sense of kind of what it was like <clears throat> is my second year of graduate school, I went to my first conference, a graduate conference, and I was the only woman on a lineup of 14 people. And um, at the conference party, one of the professors hit on me. And so when that is your kind of introduction <laughs> to uh, one, one of your introductions to an important part of your professional life that um, in many ways it, it can put you on the defensive. Um, I've also had many positive experiences, um, but, um, but I think being, being a member of an underrepresented group and then feeling singled out in ways that, that make you feel invalidated. Um, in this case, it, you know, it was, um, unwanted sexual attention from, uh, from a professor, um, uh, that can make it even more challenging. So one thing I talk about a lot with students is, um, I talk about the emotional labor that goes into some work and that's different for different people. And so if you are a member of a or multiple marginalized groups, it takes more work both to prepare to go do something and to recover from doing something. And one thing that really helped me is um, I now think of that as part of the job. So I think uh, in, I used to beat myself up over it. Like, why can't I just move on to the next thing? Or why am I having such difficulty preparing for this? And now I see it as part of what it is to be a member of an underrepresented group in, in my field. Um, you know, because now I'm, whether or not I get singled out for treatment um, in virtue of being a woman or in virtue of, you know, something else at a conference, that mental load of thinking that that might happen is always there. Um, and uh, so yeah. now, you know, taking it from, you know, more like putting the hat of, you know, like, so if we were to change the system, what would what would it take to be more supportive and now in this in this other aspect right you know so you know get someone better prepared emotionally more equipped you know or what you say like this meant this emotional labor like what what should we do um to really foster that such that you know women in philosophy but then many other fields because it's a story that you know like since i've been running this this growing up in academia this is a story that you hear in many, many, many contexts, right? Some fields are, of course, like way worse than others. Like, you know, mathematics is, you know, we're gonna have like Leonard Bloom, you know, she was, you know, like one of the first mathematicians, you know, her husband, you know, won the field medal, you know, she did and like, you know, there's all of these stories, you know. Um, but the point is like, we know, you know, the, the stats tells us that, okay, there is less uh, women, there is, you know, like there's underrepresented groups like that. What can we do or what should we be doing? to you know, make it more attractive, to make it more safe, um, and to allow people to really you know, grow and, and foster and, and, and flourish, right? So what should we be doing, all of us, you know? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think it's such a complex issue and problem and it needs, it needs all you know, uh, interventions from uh, lots of different directions. Um, and some of it has to do with, you know, general societal cultural issues. Um, so, you know, another another story that uh, that I tell sometimes is I went to a, a conference, and this was um, uh, this was actually um, an ASSC, so it was um, uh, an interdisciplinary conference um, for the study of consciousness and. Um, I was teaching, I was doing a tutorial <clears throat> and um, I go up to the registration desk and I literally say, I am a speaker. 
I need the Wi-Fi password. And they say back to me, I'm sorry, the Wi-Fi the Wi-Fi password is only for speakers. Right. <laughs> so <laughs> I can be as direct and as literal as possible. Sometimes it still doesn't register that somebody who looks like me is a speaker for a big conference like that. And so um the reason why I share that story is that counteracting the experience of these kinds of things is really difficult because a lot of a lot of the um a lot of the difficulties are are um people don't even notice they're doing them <laughs> and it's it's uh unconscious or implicit um and so I do think there needs to be much more awareness around them. I think there needs to be much more education about um, inclusivity and open-mindedness about what a philosopher looks like or what um, what someone who is uh, an expert looks like uh, in any field. Um, uh, but I do think generally it it comes from sort of all different all different angles from you know, making sure our, our syllabi are diverse and talking about the way syllabi are constructed narratives where we make choices about who to include and who to exclude and what stories to tell. Um, uh, I do think more open-mindedness about um, where the good creative ideas are going to come from is really important. I think that there are lots of assumptions about who the next innovators are going to be. Um, what, what do you perceive as, as, as the bias there? Um, well, so the line, especially in philosophy, I think, the line between saying something brilliant and saying something totally off the wall is not always clear, <laughs> right? And so the mm -hmm. question is, who gets the benefit of the doubt? Mm -hmm. um, and how do you, how can we cultivate people's ideas and cultivate their projects um, so that even if they're off the, off the sort of beaten path a little bit, we have those opportunities for people to really develop and stand out. Uh, Besides, I mean, the being off is something that only history tells, right? Sometimes, you know, how many people were off and then they were right in the long run. <laughs> <laughs> so being off today doesn't mean that you're going to be off forever, right? Right, right. Part yeah. of the revolutions in science is literally, you know, if people were super off, like, you know, somebody thought that the earth was squared and, you know, or that, you know, we were the center of the universe and, you know, good news, you know, or bad news, we were displaced, right? And it was, you know, so, and this is the, the, the uh, perhaps like a larger issue. How are we respectful to ideas that perhaps might feel that we don't understand them, you know, or that they are strange, but that if ultimately might lead to something important. Right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Now let me bring you to something that you know, uh, perhaps this is again like my own perception, but I, from listening to stories and interacting with a lot of my students, I also have got the impression that it's women that usually struggle with these internal demons. I'm not good enough. I need to keep working. I need to work on myself, you know. Uh, and I don't have necessarily that same experience with my, you know, male colleagues or with my male students. You know, oftentimes they are doing exactly the same work, but somebody, you know, my female students think that they need to work harder to get something, and the others don't. So how many, how how much of this is also internalized? And it's not just, you know, like the the circles that we are surrounded with yeah i think that's a great question and i think um i think in some ways it's a double-edged sword so i think for a lot of us i definitely feel like you know in graduate school i felt like i had to work twice as hard i really wanted to prove myself um i definitely have perfectionist tendencies and in some ways that served me well um because i i you know like with the counterexample story, being sort of extra prepared and extra sharp, I think did give me <clears throat> did give me certain avenues and certain openings that I wouldn't have had otherwise. Um, but it can also be counterproductive. It can also be something that gets in gets in our way. Um, and so, um, 
Uh, so um, I think, well, let me let me give a, a story from from just this pandemic of something something very recent. So in May of 2020, I got so I submitted a paper to to a prestigious journal, and I got a revise and resubmit decision. And along with it, I got a 13 page referee report, which is um, huge. It's by far the longest referee report I've ever gotten. Um, and it was entirely overwhelming, especially at that time in my life when um, I had just moved to Denver. Um, I had just become a stepmom. I had become a parent for the first time. I was um, turning in my tenure file all in the same period of a few months. And I could not bring myself to tackle this referee report. I just could not do it. And two years later, <laughs> I still had not tackled this referee report. Um, and I, because, because I, um, partially because I was kind of upset at the differential in the sense that some people had way more time during the pandemic and some people had way less. And, um, and so it felt like I was being asked to do this, um, not just to respond to a regular referee report, but to go above and beyond during a time that was um, more challenging and stressful um, for me and for many, especially women who are childcare providers. Um, but I also felt like my perfectionism was getting in the way that I wasn't going to, I, I couldn't do it. And so what I ended up doing is I ended up asking a friend of mine to come on as, um, as co-author and to take a stab at the first round of revisions for me. Um, and he turns out, it's a small world, turns out he was another referee on the paper who had recommended acceptance. <laughs> and so we, we um, you know, we squared everything off with the journal so that they knew what the situation was and they approved of it. Um, but he did, he took this first stab at revisions and then I went in and I could, once he had gotten us started, then I could do it, especially with someone who I felt believed in me and believed in the project. So mm -hmm. part of the challenge of the report was feeling like, here's this project that I really believed in and here were all the reasons why this project wasn't gonna work. The so examples. Sorry, <laughs> the counter examples. Right, right, <laughs> right. And and so having being able to have that collaborative um, experience and to work with someone who reminded me of all of the reasons why I wrote that paper in the first place and why the project was worth doing was huge. And so one of the things that I really think is um, we often think that we need to deal with these things or battle these things on our own. And that can be even more lonely and isolating. And I think working on, it's something that I've tried to do more and more in the last few years is to really work on cultivating my community and um, getting the support that I need and able to be able to continue, um, continue my work. Um, um, one of the questions in the chat is about like, people speaking up about mental health or around um, issues of anxiety. Um, and I think for me, one of the things is, although there can be, you know, and often is a kind of bro-y culture um, and not just in philosophy and a lot of, um, a lot of the sciences too, um, finding our people is crucial finding the people who support you and believe in you um, is really one of the only way that I've gotten through is by having some of those people um, who really remind me what it is that I bring that's of value. Um, How do you do that? <sighs> that's a great question. I think, um, I think it I, for me, it's been really listening to people. So, you know, it depends on, you know, there's there's this sort of, especially in fields that are as competitive, you know, competitive ac academic fields, there's this pressure to continue proving yourself. And so if someone, you know, says, 
you know, I don't quite believe you or <clears throat> ask you to prove yourself over again. Of course, there are some things that can be good about that. Um, but there are also people who say, oh, yes, I understand that. And here's why your idea is important. And, um, and they do try to help you develop your ideas. It's not that there isn't that kind of back and forth that helps you improve and grow, but it comes from a percent up. It comes from a position of understanding the value of the project or of what you're trying to do, or of you as a, as a person in the field. And so I really try to look out for that now. Um, whereas I think before I was really, you know, when I was younger, I was more focused on trying to prove myself. Um, now I'm trying to be more focused on finding the people who already think that I'm doing something pretty good <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and want, and want me to do more of it with them. Mm -hmm. um. I mean, one of the, you know, so, so again, these conversations, again, one of the things that, you know, keep coming back is the role of mentors, supporters, people that accompany you. Yeah. And then lift you up in moments when, you know, things are not that great or, you know, and then very often it's not necessarily because we always think about it. Okay. So who needs to be my mentor, my supervisor or my postdoc advisor or, and very often, you know, like it's not necessarily the case. I mean, sometimes, it, sometimes it happens to be the case that the same person fulfills many roles, but it doesn't necessarily have to be. Um, so, that, and I, I and I, that's why I was asking, like, how do you find those people? Because it, it also, it seemed to me that there is also, and, and, you, and, and, you, and in your narrative, it was also this shift in perspective. Like now you are open to that, right? Mm -hmm. Now you're looking for those, right? So perhaps these people have always been there, but we just don't seek them enough, right? So, you know, perhaps that's yet another, another way to, you know, flourish is by just finding your group and not only the ones that, you know, share your ideas, but you know, just people that, you know, are willing to, you know, be with you through those, through those times, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, so, sorry, I'm just trying to remember the first part of the question. So the first part was like, how do you find those people or how do you, yeah, I mean, I think part of it is putting yourself out there. So some of my best mentors have, I've never shared an institution with them. Mm -hmm. uh, so they, they have not been official mentors in any, in any sort of official capacity. Um, but they were people who I started running into at conferences, um, who thought that I asked good questions or enjoyed talking with me at, um, you know, during lunches or the informal, informal times. And, um, and I started to build relationships with them and they started to build relationships with me. And especially when I went through, um, you know, I, I talk about the decision to, to come to Denver, um, as a decision that was for me, super clear, but extremely hard. So it wasn't a difficult decision in the sense that it was very clear what I had to do. Um, so in that sense, the decision was easy. <laughs> um, but the fallout and dealing with, okay, how do I, how do I put all of the things in place that I need? That was very difficult. And so um, uh, I really relied on these relationships with mentors at other institutions um to you know to bounce ideas off of and to help me think through what my options were um so i do encourage people to go to conferences and to meet people and although it's difficult to put themselves out there a little bit um uh because you never know who is going to get excited about you or your projects And they might not look like you. So, um, you know, I have had, you know, some really helpful mentorship relationships with other women, but I would say that many of my deepest mentorship relationships have been with men. Um, and so in some ways it didn't matter <laughs> that, um, that we had different life experiences. Um, 
uh, what mattered more was the sense of mutual respect. Um, and then sometimes you really need the advice of someone who's gone through something similar to you. And that's important to seek out too. So like you said, um, there's no, I think it's a mistake to look for one mentor who's going to do everything for you. Mm -hmm. Rather, looking for people who value you and respect you and want to support you and look for what they specifically can provide you. Um, and also what you can provide them, you know, it goes both ways, but um, looking for what it is that, that they can really help you with and, uh, and to ask for that when you need it. Um, yeah. Let me now grab two questions from the audience. So one is, um which I think is a very interesting one regarding philosophy. How much interdisciplinary work there is in philosophy? So is it common and what does it look like? This person is a computer scientist with a philosophical bent, but, but he's also she's also interested in AI and cognitive science new, or new in, in, in consciousness. So how much of that there is and how much actually philosophers work with others, which is yet another. <laughs> yeah, um, so... I think, especially in fields like philosophy of mind and cognitive science um, and artificial intelligence, there is a lot of interdisciplinary work. I think um, the philosophers who are drawn to those fields want to do interdisciplinary work. Um, so I think there's a lot of room, especially, um, you know, we always love computer scientists who are more philosophical and who uh, want to have those conversations. Um, uh, there are challenges to doing real interdisciplinary work. So um, some of the challenges that I think um, that are difficult to overcome is one, there's a often a language um, barrier. <laughs> so the terminology as it gets used in philosophy is often very different from the terminology as it gets used in computer science. Um, uh, or other fields. And so there's kind of a big investment in figuring out how to speak with the same vocabulary, or at least to understand the other disciplines vocabulary um, in a way that um, uh, uh, in a way that makes uh, pro um, discussions productive and projects productive. Um, another main challenge is um, that different things get rewarded in different disciplines. And so it can vary a lot how much um, how much certain kinds of projects and certain kind of work is rewarded. Um, so, uh, you know, many scientists find it really puzzling how you could do research that gets published where no studies are done, <laughs> right? And so it's like, what exactly are you doing? And so trying to explain what the incentives are and what the metrics are um, in, in, a, in philosophy, it might be different. Um, it, it is different from the metrics of many um, sciences and engineering. Um, and similarly in philosophy, you need, especially if you're early career, and I was lucky to have this at Penn where Penn was very supportive um, in this respect, but you need, um, you need a department that values that kind of interdisciplinary connection both ways um, uh, because they're going to evaluate your tenure file in part based on this interdisciplinary work that you've done. Uh, uh, so what does it look like? So I spent many years <laughs> um, hanging out with engineers in the robotics lab at Penn and often it looked like there was nothing coming of it. <laughs> um, I got lots of great ideas and lots of, it helped me really deepen my understanding of engineering as a field. Um, and it gave me lots of ideas and lots of insight for how to think about some of the problems that I was, I was approaching. But in some ways that can be indirect, right? So the way that has made it into some of my work is not, you wouldn't always see it from the surface. And then there is, is the more straightforward um, things like co-authoring and publications. And um, that, at least for me, has, although I've done it, I've done it some, um, that has been in some ways more challenging because especially if, if you're a philosopher 
trying to develop some bigger framework ideas, figuring out how to um, do something that is either experimental or something that is very concrete where people can see the practical, the engineering payoff or the scientific payoff of it. That's often very challenging and it can take years to develop um, uh, develop those kinds of ideas. So I think the major thing is actually patience and finding working relationships that are productive for you. Um, I do want to give a shout out to Sonia Roberts, who is on um, on this uh, chat because she um, uh, she was a mentee of mine um, for many years and has a PhD um, in engineering. And um, in many ways, she was the one who helped me and this other professor communicate well enough <laughs> that we could get a publication. Uh, together between the three of us. So having having people, especially students who are interested in both of these things and are willing to serve as the glue between people who are otherwise maybe set in their ways a little bit more than we should be, um, that's particularly valuable also. Um, so if you're interested, um, especially if you're a student and you're interested in doing this kind of inter interdisciplinary work, I think it's fantastic. Um, and I think there are lots of, there's a, a lot of hunger for it, especially now in the AI field where people realize that these problems are so big that no one discipline can have a complete solution. So we, we're realizing the need to work together, but there are lots of barriers to communication and barriers of incentives in different disciplines. And so, um, and so it's important to be creative and to work together to try to overcome those. I mean, my experience, you know, we, we love interdisciplinary work, but it's extremely hard. Yeah. And, and very often it feels that it's, uh, you know, it, it's, you're trying to have a conversation, but you're just getting past each other. So it's not really, you know, a, a true reciprocal conversation. Yeah. And, and and oftentimes it's also the case that there is no mutual respect. So I guess my question to you following up on that is like, how do you gain respect from the others and how do you respect others at the same time? So wow. how, how do you negotiate that aspect? Um, you know, it's interesting, the, the question of gaining gaining respect from others. You know, in many ways, my sort of, Anxiety and imposter syndrome came up yet, you know, has, has come up yet again in, in an engineering setting because although I'm actually pretty um pretty competent with formal methods, it's always been an area where I've had anxiety around it. And a lot of the discussion and, and work that I've been doing with engineers um, and computer scientists, um, they use mathematics that is beyond what I was ever trained in or um, had a ton of exposure to. And so I actually spent a lot of time trying to at least gain a conceptual understanding of some of the main mathematical ideas that were really important to the research projects of my collaborators. And of course, I would never do it to the extent that they they can do it because that's their level of expertise. But it enabled me to have a, a better understanding of what they valued in their projects and sort of how they were thinking of their projects. And it enabled me to go some distance towards communicating with them. So putting in the work to, to communicate um, and to understand the other person's projects, I think goes a long way. Um, and so I feel like I gain respect when when people realized that I was serious enough about wanting to wanting to make this interdisciplinary collaboration work that I would put in the time to to learn some new things that wouldn't necessarily benefit me on my own, but really enabled us to talk to each other. Um, uh, and then, you know, I think mutual respect is something that happens over time where you, um, you know, you give them something that feels valuable and insightful to them and they do the same for you. And you realize, oh, I couldn't have come to this 
um, idea or this understanding on my own, or I couldn't have done this project on my own. I really needed this group. Um, and that's something that in, in the sciences might be more, um, more part of the culture because often papers are co-authored, you're often working more in groups. In philosophy, many papers are single authored and we're still sort of catching up to the co-authorship model, which I think is a super important model. I think we often do much, much better work in collaboration. Um, and so uh, I think philosophers are getting onto this though, that, that this is a really important way of working. And next question. Did you have trainees when you moved from Philadelphia to Denver? And if so, how did you manage that aspect of your move? Oh, that is a really good question. <laughs> the answer is yes. And um, so I didn't have anyone I was directly, I was the main supervisor for um, at, at the time of my move. But I did have and do have many people um, students whose committees I'm on. And um, I gave all of them the option of keeping me on their committees while being remote. Um, and so I've stayed on all of those committees <laughs> and, uh, and it's a lot of work, <laughs> um, but it's something that I feel very passionately about. You know, I feel like if I want academia to invest in me as a person, I need to invest in my mentees and trainees as, as their own people too. And I, I feel strongly that um, taking on graduate students is much more than um, much more than a buy the books <laughs> kind of arrangement. Um, you're making a personal investment in, in that, in that person. Um, and so I've uh, done uh I've done one dissertation defense so far by Zoom since leaving Penn. Um, I have another one coming up in, um, in a couple of months. Um, it is challenging because I have now all my new responsibilities and then I, I'm keeping these older ones, um, but that's really important. So I didn't take anyone with me. Um, I don't think I could have because Denver doesn't have a PhD program in philosophy. So that's a, been a big shift for me. Whereas um, <clears throat> one of the things that was really one of the most rewarding parts of my job was working with PhD students at Penn. Um, and so it's still nice to be able to have that connection. Um, and I have, I have um, students who've graduated too um, and who've moved on to the next thing. And I still keep in touch with them and mentor them and, uh, so, uh, yeah, so officially nobody moved with me, but I'm still connected to all of the, all of my trainees. Well, so if there are no more questions, I wanna ask you the last one, you know, before we, we go. So if you had to start all over again, what would you do differently in your life, in, in, in your academic <laughs> life, in your, in your life, in your uh, academic life? Um, You know, this is, um, and this is reflected in the way that I try to train and mentor people too, but I think um, for a long time, I thought that it took me, it took me a while to get to the point where um, I could be much more compassionate with myself about um, anxiety, about imposter syndrome, about um, uh, burnout and to really work on, um, not viewing those as like ref reflections of my aptitude, <laughs> um, and not to, not to be too hard on myself or beat myself up over it. Um, and I really wish I had done that earlier. I didn't know how I didn't have the resources or the examples, but if I had done that earlier, I think maybe, um, I would have been more open to other possibilities and options and who knows what I could have done differently. Um, but I think I would have been, um, I would have been happier earlier, uh, and less lonely. So I really wish I had done, I had done those things earlier, but I didn't know how, 
Um, and so that's one of the reasons why I try to talk about it. Um, and so maybe, maybe some of this will resonate with some people uh, who are listening and um, they'll have the chance to, to think through some things that it took me, took me longer to think through. And where would you tell your future self? Not your past self, but your future self. Oh, <laughs> I do try to tell my future self that it's going to be okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay. For, um, uh, you know, there, it's uh, the last couple of years have been a little bit of um, just jumping into the deep end and trusting that it's all going to work out. Um, and I try to be really open-minded about what that's going to look like. Um, uh, so, uh, so yeah, I don't know what my future self is going to look like exactly, but, uh, um, but I try to believe in, I try to believe in her. I try to believe that she'll have things figured out, <laughs> even though I, do, I have no idea what that's going to be yet. Um, I try to have faith in, faith in future Lisa. And I'm sure she will do well. <laughs> that that I can that I can definitely you know, without knowing for sure I can say that she will do well. You know, you just have to listen to her. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Lisa. I want to thank you for, you know, for being so open open for you know also for you know your research. You know, it's, you know you know you have also courageously go into AI. You know, like and things that you know a couple of years ago we we're not even thinking about in the in the consciousness community. So I think that there is a lot that. You know, you have not only ventured into your inner you know, experience and try to make yourself you know, like better and so on, but also in your in in general, you have been like a wanderer, you know, like trying to break new paths. Um, and for being so courageous, you know, like I really think that it takes um, as you said, you know, like sometimes understanding that you want to ground yourself, like you know, you know, if the decision to leave, you know, Philadelphia to go to Denver must have been like an easy one, as you said, because you know, you know that it's the family, but it's also an extremely hard one you know, and you deal with that every day. So I just want to really thank you for, you know, the, also the demonstrate that, you know, it's good to be courageous sometimes, you know, and, you know follow your heart and you know, your future self will do it. You know? so, <laughs> thank you so, thank so, you so much. much. Thank you. And thanks to everybody who was on and asked questions and listened. And it was really a pleasure to get to, uh, to have this discussion with you. So thank you so much. Take care, everyone. You know, good night or good evening or good day, you know, for wherever you are in the whatever time zone. And see you all in the next one, which is you know with Ophelia De Roy on the 13th of March. So take care, everyone. Ciao, ciao, Lisa. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.